Okay, so let's get started with our uh, first lecture, uh, chapter one, which basically describes uh, some of the concepts that you already have learned uh, in your uh, previous classes, classes that were that are prerequisites for this uh, course. And so, um, you know, what is biochemistry? Um, biochemistry is nothing but, you know, chemistry of life, right? Uh, what kind of chemical reactions happen um, in our cells uh, so that our cells together, um, for example, in a tissue, can function, um, can do their function, and while doing their function, they also talk to uh, each other. So there is, there are means to actually convey uh, certain types of signaling uh, between the cells, between the tissues, and uh, it is, uh, you know, uh, both cellular foundation, chemical foundation, uh, physical foundation, as well as evolutionary uh, foundation. These all together uh, make the foundation of biochemistry. Now, one question uh, students um, often ask is, uh, you know, what makes um, it unique for a living organism, right? So a living organism, um, you know, you know, have uh, typically uh, has a high degree of chemical complexity and uh, they are organized at the microscopic levels, highly organized. Uh, they will. They are able to um, uh, extract and sometimes transform um, energy from their environment. And uh, each organism's components, like you know, types of cells and tissues, um, they have a very well-defined function. And uh, as I said before, um, there is a coordinated regulation. Uh, among them, right? Um, living organisms have mechanisms of sensing. They can actually respond to any alterations uh, in their surroundings, for example. And uh, they can also self-replicate. So they can actually make more of themselves. They can self-assemble. And uh, most importantly, um, as you know, uh, they have a capacity to change over time by uh, gradual evolution. And in, in the context of coronavirus, you just saw uh, COVID-19 as it uh, was discovered, uh, we already are seeing various variants of coronavirus, uh, which are more uh, uh, virulent. And that's because the virus is rapidly evolving. And uh, the appreciation for, uh, you know, human body, um, I always uh, like to give you guys uh, some examples so you can see how biological systems are so complex at the same time, so organized, okay? If you have to guess, uh, you know, uh, how many types of bacterial species exist in your gut alone, um, you'll be surprised, okay? There are about 40, uh, 40 to 45,000 uh, types of bacterial species exist in your gut alone, human gut. And if you want to actually uh, ask the questions, okay, um, that many bacterial species, what would be number of bacterial cells then in human uh, microbiome? And that number is about 100 trillion, 100 trillion, <laughs> okay. And uh, just to put things in context, human body, uh, you know, itself contains approximately, you know, 35 to 40 trillion cells. So you have more uh, number of bacterial cells in human body than uh, the human cells itself, right? That's, that's something uh, interesting. And so, yeah, our uh, cells, but all cells are not the same, right? 
um, you know from your uh, basic biology. I mean, the largest cell in human body, I think, is um, is uh, a female egg. Um, it's I think about uh, a micron, uh, a, a millimeter long, a thousand micron uh, in diameter. Um, in terms of the smallest cell, um, it's the sperm cell. Um, and uh, it's just like a nucleus, which is you know, propelled by um, uh, flagellum and mitochondria. Um, okay, so those are small, uh, an example of really small and um, uh, largest cell. Uh, what about the longest cells? Uh, longest cells um, in human body uh, are neurons. You know, neurons that uh, carry messages uh, uh, within the nervous system, right? Um, I believe the longest uh, neuron in human body is the one that actually starts from your from the base of your spinal cord and goes all the way to the uh, big toe uh, of the foot. Um, uh, that uh, neuron is part of the sciatic nerve. Uh, you must have heard some people have actually very painful experience when the sciatic nerve uh, gets pinched. So um, these, uh, these uh, facts uh, of biology actually makes uh, um, the biochemistry really, really fascinating how really these things work. And so um, this is a slide that actually tells you, uh, um, if you can pick up, uh, can you see my cursor by any chance? Yeah. Yes. Okay, perfect. That's good. So um, this is a, a slide that actually um, shows you uh, the landmarks in the evolution of life on Earth. And so um, it is estimated that uh, about 15 uh, or so billion years ago, uh, our universe uh, formed uh, as a cataclysmic uh, explosion of, uh, you know, hot, uh, energy-rich atomic particles that came together to form um, um, heavier uh, elements. Um, within that uh, explosion, within seconds of that explosion, uh, what we call it Big Bang, uh, the simplest elements like hydrogen and helium formed. And then the universe slowly expanded and eventually cooled and then the material uh, came together, condensed, uh, often under the influence of gravity to form stars. And at some point, star explosion happened. And then the more complex elements formed, right? So that led to the formation of these rocks and planets. And you must have heard about the Stardust program of NASA, which actually tried to explore uh, how life may have formed on our planet, right? So, um, so th there is some estimate that the formation of Earth was uh, uh, about four and a half billion years ago. And uh, when um, Earth formed, um, the earliest uh, cells I know that formed um, during the evolution uh, was the cell that actually uh, didn't uh, form in the oxygen rich environment because there was no oxygen. Okay, so likely the atmosphere uh, was reducing environment. Okay, so uh, the earliest cells uh, may have used inorganic fuel, uh, fuel like ferrous sulfide or ferrous carbonate. Okay, you know that iron can exist in a wide range of oxidation states. Uh, starting from minus two to plus six. Although we know plus two and plus three are the most common that we encounter them in our uh, chemistry classes. And so because the 
earth environment uh, didn't have any oxygen, uh, the earliest cells were anaerobic in nature. So uh, under uh, anaerobic conditions, um, you know, species uh, could oxidize um, organic compounds to carbon dioxide. Uh, and they did it uh, by passing electrons not to molecular oxygen, but to an acceptor like maybe sulfate ion, and thereby yielding hydrogen sulfide as a product. Okay, so there are some evidence to suggest that. And then eventually oxygen producing uh, photosynthesis, uh, uh, oxygen producing uh, cyanobacteria um, came about on the planet Earth. And then the oxygen became um, slowly rich. Uh, the environment became slowly rich in oxygen. And then you had uh, appearance of aerobic bacteria uh, around two and a half billion years ago. Uh, so, Professor, question? Yes. So that means that cyanobacteria was the first oxygen, oxygen um, like uh, ancestor of most aerobic. That's, uh, right. That's what uh, we know. Aerobic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And uh, about one and a half billion years ago, um, um, uh, first eukaryotes uh, were formed, uh, protists. Now protists, uh, you know, are a species uh, that could be uh, single cellular or multicellular uh, eukaryotes, uh, but they lack uh, specialized tissues. And, okay, so slowly uh, then you had like uh, appearance of red and green algae and uh, appearance of these uh, endosymbionts. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, uh, can you mute yourself? Somebody is chatting here. Um, so endosymbiont is any organism that lives within the body or cells of another organisms, right? And uh, is involved in endosymbiosis. So um, mitochondria, you know, there is evidence to suggest that you actually can isolate mitochondria and mitochondria can, can produce ATP uh, from the surrounding uh, on its own. So pretty, pretty uh, uh, cool, uh, I think, milestone in the evolution uh, where um, uh, you had endosymbiont actually working uh, with uh, within the cell to make the evolution process go even uh, better and better. Uh, so that's, that's what uh, um, the process of evolution looks like. And uh, this slide actually um, tells you that um, um, different species like plants, right? Plants are eukaryotic cells, you know that plants, birds, uh, animals of different species, they all share with humans, uh, you know, the same basic structural units. They all have uh, cells and those cells are very similar, right? They have the same kinds of micromolecules like DNA, RNA and proteins. And they're all made up of uh, simple uh, monomeric subunits like nucleotides and amino acids for protein and nucleotides for DNA and RNA. And they utilize very similar pathways for synthesis of uh, you know, various cellular components. So they can grow. They share the same genetic codes, right? And they usually um, have evolved from the same ancestors. Okay, so this is a painting by the Garden of Eden. Um, and that's what it's trying to describe here. That although the species represented in the paintings look very different, but at the very basic, basic level, they share uh, uh, amazing amount of similarities. Okay, so... Um, so here again, to repeat, all uh, living um, 
things make use of the same types of biomolecules, right? And all of them use energy. And uh, we can, as a result, all living things, plants, bacteria, yeast, uh, we can study them using the methods of chemistry and physics and biochemistry. And there are uh, uh, similarities at the very fundamental levels of each of these cells. Um, so let's, let's move forward and see if we can um, look at some other distinctive feature of the living system that I think I already alluded to that although organisms are complicated, um, they are very organized, okay? So it's not just randomly things moving here and there. Uh, if an organelle in the cell is moving from one end to the other, that actually is very carefully orchestrated by the cytoskeleton, for example, of the cell. And uh, the uh, biological molecules have unique structures and the reason they have unique structures is because they serve very important function, okay? And living, living systems are constantly in, engaging themselves in energy transformations and they're always constantly sensing their environment, whether they need to produce ATP or they can stop producing ATP and so on. Um, and they're able to replicate and evolve uh, eventually, right? Um, now, people were looking for evidence, okay? It is known, it was known that early atmosphere contained these gases, for example, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, ammonia, um, methane, nitrogen, iron sulfide, uh, hydrogen sulfide, and water, etc. Right? So, one of the big question was to provide evidence. Can we take these primitive gases and without using the power of enzymes or biochemistry, is it possible to make uh, biomolecules by chemical means, by using simple chemistry? For example, explosion. Let's say explosion happens, high temperature, pressure, right? Um, um, the cataclysmic explosion that we were talking about. Can these gases come together and form something that could eventually give rise to life? Okay, can you produce biomolecules by chemical means, um, by um, non-biological means, right? So uh, the answer was um, rendered by uh, Miller and Ure, um, they are the professors, they were the professors at University of Chicago, I believe in 1952. And uh, they performed this very interesting experiment where you can see this apparatus right here. Uh, there is a big um, glass bulb here, right? And uh, there is a condenser here, just like condenser you use in your ergo class. And, uh, you know, they are connected. They can actually remove the uh, gases from this um, um, apparatus uh, by using pump, or you can uh, pump in whatever gas you like. Okay, and then what you, they, have, they did was, this is what we call spark discharge apparatus. Spark discharge apparatus is where you actually have two electrodes. They're not touching each other, but they are in very close contact. And uh, they fill their, um, in this equipment with these gases, ammonia, methane, hydrogen, and water, okay? And uh, they applied voltage onto these electrodes. And when they applied voltage, electrons jumped from one electrode to the other, creating spark. And they did that experiment a few times and they stopped it. And they basically tried to analyze whatever condensed here, 
okay whatever contents um, in the apparatus they went ahead and tried to analyze and when they did that um, you know and when they subjected these gaseous uh, material to electrical sparks and they analyzed the contents uh, they were able to see that they found compounds that were like amino acids amino acids are what are amino acids amino acids are compounds that has an amino group as well as as a carboxylic a carboxylic acid group on it okay so the fact that they were able to show that you can actually form biomolecule the basic component of a protein amino acid by simply creating taking the primitive gases and you know creating uh, electrical spark it provided us with the first proof that biomolecules may have uh, formed by chemical evolution non biological evolution okay that was a very very um uh important i think uh, discovery in the field um so is this like the experiment when you centrifuge when you centrifuge um cells no it's not um, this is an experiment uh, which is what i just described Centri- yeah as in like you separate all some organelles from super molecular structures or something no not at all okay. yeah, so in science we can do a million types of experiments and this has nothing to do with centrifugation or cells or anything remember we are try what we are trying to do here is to prove or uh, not me uh, it's miller and ure in these experiments they are actually trying to prove if they can create any biological molecules by simple uh, chemical means without using any enzymes chemical okay. evolution okay okay can you form organic compounds you know by simply uh, using chemical evolution as opposed to non biological evolution you know chemical evolution as a result of let's say actions of lightning right and the heat that comes from volcanoes um so this was uh, the first proof um as i said the uh, first uh, cell possibly used there is enough evidence to suggest that first cells first cell may have probably used inorganic fuels like ferrous sulfide and ferrous carbonate and they were both abundant on early earth okay so for example you can actually do a reaction of uh, ferrous sulfide and hydrogen sulfide so that will be fes and h2s and you can actually make uh, iron disulfide which will be fe2s and hydrogen gas and this reaction actually can yield enough energy to drive the synthesis of atp uh, or similar such, such similar compounds and atp is you know energy rich molecule that is utilized by the cells to carry out various metabolic processes so um, organic compounds you know uh, in these early cells uh, may have uh, uh, formed by the non biological actions you know for example lightning or uh, heat etc okay so we got to go move a little bit faster i think um, we are still at eight slides <laughs> so uh, all right so this is uh, phylog- phylogeny of three domains of life what here um, they have done is that um, biologists have classified uh, life into these three main domains okay and uh, phylogenetic uh, relationships uh, you know as you see here like three kind of structure you can generate this type of structure what we call family tree by doing you know by doing many things for example okay you can let's say take uh, in this case i know that they took ribosomal rna of each group of these species okay are uh, ribosomal rna from each of these groups of species and they basically compared their sequences and if the sequences were similar they put them on the same branch okay for example here 
And if the se sequences were different, depending on how different, they would go and put them on different branches. And that's how they generated this tree, okay, using ribosomal RNA. But you can generate such trees by actually making analysis of any conserved proteins, like for example, chaperones, uh, proteins that are involved in uh, protein folding processes. Uh, very many chaperonins are conserved proteins. So they exist in many of these species. You can actually just take the sequence of those proteins and uh, create a phylogenetic tree. So clearly when you look at this, you can see that um, archaea and eukarya are on the same branch. So uh, archaeas were similar to eukarya. And archaeas are the species that actually inhabit extreme environment, like, you know, high salt lakes, uh, hot springs, and, you know, ocean depths, right? So those are the species here. So they are very similar to uh, eukarya because not very similar, they're, they're on the same branch. They are similar to eukarya than to bacteria because bacterial evolution happens early on. And you can see that it di they diversed in their evolution very early on. So, um, uh, professor, yes, for the, um, I got a different one from the seventh edition. I don't know if that's the same uh, graph of in the seventh edition, but there's some differences between um, each area of eukarya, archaea, bacteria, the your name different, yeah, yeah the different there are different organisms. Well, some of what's them, your name? not all of them. Uh, Zach. Zach. Zach, uh, yeah, of course, it's updated and they have always okay. tried to uh, make the figures uh, a little more updated and, you know, science is evolving. So don't be so caught up with that. If you have different, okay. versions, you will see somewhat different. Okay. Yep. Uh, so um, biologists also classify uh, life uh, by these following six kingdoms and you know them already. So I have just put them here multicellular uh, eukaryotes uh, are animalia. And then you have also plants. Fungi are uni and are multicellular eukaryotic organisms and so on. So um, let's uh, quickly um, go through uh, some more classifications. Organisms can also be classified uh, according to the type of energy source they use and the carbon source they use. Okay, so this is uh, the slide that actually tells you uh, troughs in Greek means um, nourishments. So um, just uh, autotrophs would be um, species that can synthesize all their biomolecules directly from carbon dioxide and heterotrophs would require you know, organic nutrients uh, to synthesize their uh, biomolecules. But you can see here, if the energy source is chemical, then they're called chemotrops. And if they are using carbon source from carbon dioxide, then you will call them chemoautotrophs. But if they're using organic compounds like how we do and many plants, uh, well, um, many bacteria do, you can actually, uh, we come under chemoheterotrophs. Again, they can be further classified by uh, what kind of species accept electrons, okay? So the final electron acceptor in your metabolism is molecular oxygen. And so we have this, and if it's not oxygen, then you have these species and so on. Uh, one, set, one thing I want to tell you here at the onset, although we have not started to talk about metabolism, is that uh, we are mostly concerned here with uh, human metabolism and uh, we human carry out oxidative metabolism. Okay, what that means is that when we eat our food, whatever it is, fat, proteins, or carbohydrates, what we do in metabolism or what our cells do in metabolism is that they strip away electrons from these fuel molecules. They take electrons out of those uh, fuel molecules, whether they are proteins, lipids, fat, or 
carbohydrates and transfer those electrons ultimately to molecular oxygen to generate water okay and carbon dioxide we'll talk about that that comes towards the end of the this class but that's what it means uh, our electrons from our fuel goes to molecular oxygen okay so that's something you might want to just know up front anyway if the energy source is light then they are called phototrophs and if the carbon source is carbon dioxide they are called photoautotrophs and you can see plants etc uh, are here and if they are using organic compounds then they are called photo uh, heterotrophs so just look at these slides and uh, familiarize yourself that you can also classify organisms you know uh, based on their source of energy and carbon now i don't want to spend too much time here you guys know this very well right what the animal cells look like do you want me to go over this yes professor yeah so this is just a, an animal cell um, typically animal cells are uh, smaller uh, they are uh, they range from 5 to 50 micron uh plant cells which i'll show a little bit later in the next slide are typically larger uh, they are 10 to 100 micron in diameter and the size of the cells actually during evolution depended on um, the availability of uh, resources that was needed to uh, survive and that was needed for the survival of that cell so our cells uh, are smaller than the plant cells uh and that's because one of the reason is because we carry out oxidative metabolism so we actually use molecular oxygen very actively so our cells actually are able to consume oxygen and that oxygen should be able to reach to different organelles within the cell very quickly so it doesn't make sense to have one large cell where the oxygen diffusion will be rather cumbersome and difficult and slow so that's one uh, likely factor why animal cells are smaller and more compact uh, but they are basically showing you you know all the organelles here um, the ones that are uh, shown here in red uh, are the unique organelles in uh, for example here in animal cells lysosome lysosome is uh, lysosome is what we call uh, a trash compactor of the cell it houses several enzymes that will actually take unwanted biomolecules and convert them into monomers degrade them and so uh, you have uh, lysosome in the animal cells and of course you see nucleus etc so uh, the plant cells are shown here and plant cells have several um, organelles that are unique to them and they are shown here in the red uh, plant cells have cell walls like bacteria um, and uh, you know we just review this and make sure you know this um i couldn't find this in the seventh edition is there any um is that from the fifth edition jack you cannot uh, you know ask me such questions you know you know think about it i have okay. to um, explain to you again that recommended textbook is seventh edition i try to use uh, uh, most updated picture so if there was anything missing from the previous version which are actually does happen as you noted it actually is not missing from the lecture okay so i am not recommending that you use fifth version or fourth version or third version of textbook don't get me wrong the recommended version is still the one that i am actually using and i try to use for a reason i'm using it for the reason so i have the most latest information for you do you understand yeah, yes yes so, thank you so yeah we we can go over because i lose my chain of thoughts and you know it's, it's of course i apologize you know, not at all there is no apology apology needed here i'm just trying to explain to you so you know um, you know we we uh, we are still going through the slides okay thank you mm -hmm. um so here is a bacterial cell bacterial cells are fascinating um, you know if you were uh, tomorrow uh, if you were to go to graduate school and let's say you want to do research one of the most fascinating area of research is actually to go uh, and develop new types of antibiotics 
okay why because i will explain to you a little bit later in my enzyme mechanism class we are at a stage where a simple you know cut during your football game can actually kill you okay why because these bacteria we have uh, uh, species of bacteria they are called superbugs uh, uh, and these bacteria these superbugs uh, no antibiotics work on them okay so what happens is let's say you got a cut unfortunately and you got infected with a superbug you can actually use any types of antibiotics whether you know topically or you are chugging some antibiotics this wound will not heal for you okay and eventually the wound will take away your arms your legs who knows depending on the severity of infections so the reason um, that is happening is because bacterial evolution is quite rapid just like viruses and so they are always outsmarting you know scientists in terms of uh, medicine so um I'm just showing you bacterial cell wall here bacterial um, structure here basic structure bacteria of course have a simple uh, circular dna molecule you can see this species called pili that provides uh, adhesion to the surface of other cells you have this flagellas which actually are utilized to float and move around in the surrounding and of course you have ribosomes etc there are various types of uh, uh bacterial species um uh, uh, the one that is called gram negative um hans gram uh, was the scientist actually in 1882 he realized that all bacterial species were not the same so he developed a stain that he can use to actually characterize different types of bacteria so some that will give them give him negative uh, test results will he, he will call them gram negative so gram negative bacteria is, uh, is shown here this is actual image uh, you can see that it has an inner membrane and then there is a peptidoglycan layer we'll talk about them little bit later on at very much in biochemical details you will really enjoy that i can promise and then uh, gram negative bacteria also have outer membrane okay uh gram positive bacteria don't have an outer membrane but they do have multiple layers of peptidoglycan layer Uh, and they have inner membrane and they stain positive with the uh, gram then you have uh, cyanobacteria they are like gram negative and they have tougher peptidoglycan layers and they are extensively cross linked and very very actually very hard to kill them and then you have archaea which are more like gram positive they don't have any outer membrane uh, and they do have uh, what they call pseudo peptidoglycan layer but just to give you that bacterial species are all very different okay and uh, you can understand uh, how evolution might be uh, good and rapid there and how they could pose a real threat to our um, existence now this is jack uh, you mentioned uh, uh, about uh, fractionation of tissues let's say you know you are really interested in um, studying uh, certain types of tissues right you are interested in an enzyme uh, that uh, is only present in liver tissues and you really want to work on that enzyme you want to isolate that so there are processes that you can do uh, to isolate specific organelles um, and uh, the contents within it of the organelle and this one is called differential centrifugation okay differential centrifugation is utilized it's a rough uh, fractionation method uh, which actually will fractionate different contents of the cell um, according to their um, um according to their uh, weight uh, buoyancy how does it work what you do is you actually take the tissue and you literally grind it homogenizes okay so you'll have all the contents in it when you uh, homogenize it right um uh, you basically will have contents of the cell all in this buffer whatever that buffer is and what you can then do is you can uh, put that tube into 
this device that will centrifugate the tube. Centrifugation is where you put the tube and you create, you basically rotate the tube uh, along the axis in from the center. Okay. So depending on what your centrifugation speed is, is for example, if you did 1000 times gravity and you did it for 10 minutes, then whatever sits at the bottom, that pellet will contain typically whole cells, nucleus, cytoskeletons, and plasma membrane. Okay, so you are enriching it, you can fractionate it. If you took that and then uh, took the supernatant of that and subjected it to a medium speed centrifugation, let's say 20,000 G for 20 minutes, then whatever forms at the bottom, the pellet will now contain your mitochondria, lysosomes and peroxisomes. So if you are interested in uh, looking at an enzyme in mitochondria, lysosome and peroxisome, you basically will just take that fraction and throw away the rest of the stuff and move on to the next step, okay? which will be the isopicnic centrifugation that will actually further refine uh, the organelle. Okay, so by doing this differential centrifugation, large and small particles in the suspension uh, can be separated by simply centrifugating it, uh, centrifugating the content at different speeds. Okay, so that's what happens here. Now, if you really want to just get the soluble protein, right, from the cell, then you go all the way here and you take the content of this cell and centrifuge it at a really, really high uh, centrifugation force, 150,000 G for three hours. And if you do that, whatever was remaining, any particle that will sit at the bottom and your supernatant will now only contain your soluble proteins. So if you are really interested in a soluble protein from the cytoplasm, that's the thing that you want. Okay. Now let's look at the isopicnic uh, centrifugation. Uh, I Yes. I have a quick question. So sure. to go from the first um, tissue homogenate to the last, do you have to go through each step and their speeds or can you just jump towards the end? No, I think you should go through the speed because uh, that's when you'll get, get fractionation. Okay. So it has to be like a stepwise process. It, it, yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Unless you know that you really don't care and you just want to just get the uh, soluble proteins. Um, then you can go all the way to last. Sometimes people can spin it to even 200,000 G for like four hours and then everything settles down and you can actually get your soluble protein, just pipe it out. Okay. But typically, you. if you want to isolate any of the other particles, uh, you should go through the process. And so um, um, people actually, uh, you know, as I said, if you want to refine your... Uh, uh, isolation, then you go from differential, you collect the um, fraction and you go for isopicnic centrifugation, which is nothing but a sucrose density centrifugation. Okay, what you do here is basically you make a, a solution of sucrose, sucrose gradient what you make, okay? So you make highest concentration of sucrose, then lower concentration and subsequently, okay? So different concentration of sucrose will give you different density. And it's a gradient that you have here. Why sucrose? Sucrose is very unique because sucrose medium has an osmotic pressure that is similar to that of other organelles in the cell. And thus it balances the diffusion of water into and out of the organelles, okay? And that's important because if you want to isolate the organelles in full, you don't want to, it to swell or burst in solution uh, of let's say lower osmolarity or higher osmolarity. Okay, so that's why the sucrose medium is very uh, critical here. So all you do is you create a gradient and then you uh, um, uh, add the contents of it. And uh, um, whenever, when you actually start the centrifugation process, okay, um, the, the, uh, what will happen is um, organelles will try to go and settle down, you know, in the density, in the, in, the, in the component where their density matches to the density of the sucrose medium, okay? So individual organelles uh, sediment uh, 
will fractionate themselves at different layers. Basically, whenever their uh, Boyan density matches with the, uh, with the density of the gradient, they will just start hanging out there, start enriching themselves. And then you can actually just, you know, fractionate it. Um, now, you might want to know how uh, we can um, study biology, biological processes. And I just want to give you an idea. I think this is just for fun um, that techniques in biology has evolved so beautifully over the years that you can literally see the processes happening in the live cells, okay? So for example, if you are study, if you are interested in studying mitosis and you, let's say you are studying, uh, you are interested in, in studying the dynamics of actin filaments during mitosis, okay? You can actually literally see that processes happening in living cells. How? It turns out that you can generate antibodies against any proteins that you want. You know, uh, right now you're, you must be hearing, right? Vaccines of COVID-19 is nothing but an antibody, right? Against uh, the antigen of the COVID-19. And so why, does, why uh, it is so cool? Because it turns out that antigen antibody interactions are very tight, very specific. So if you developed an antibody against, let's say, actin filament, your protein actin, then your antibody will only go and bind to actin and nothing else. There could be thousands and thousands of proteins in the cell, but your antibody will not go and bind. Now you'll ask, oh, so how come red? What uh, you know, technology in biology has evolved in such a way that you can take that antibody that you generate and you can covalently modify it with a fluorophore. What is a fluorophore? Fluorophore is an organic molecule that will fluoresces. Just like, you know, Star Wars, um, those swords, right? Those are fluorescent molecules. They absorb energy of a particular light and then they will emit energy, right? So you can actually take the antibodies and conjugate that antibody to different types of fluorophore, different color fluorophores and literally watch the dynamics uh, in living cells. So this is what is shown here. You can see a cell has divided two daughter cells and you can see uh, the bundles of actin filaments. They're called stress fibers. They're emanating at the boundary, right? Micro uh, tubules, um, they, they are stained here in the green. They are actually starting from the centers and going towards the periphery of the cell. And of course, you see the chromosomes that are stained in blue here. So you can literally study the processes. Now, that's at the you know, cellular level. At the basic levels, still chemistry, okay? So level one is shown here for the components of the cell here, plant cell, for example. You have nucleotides that actually makes DNA. And DNA is what makes chromatin. Chromatin is nothing but DNA and protein, right? Proteins are made from amino acids, right? So that's the monomeric unit of the, all the proteins. It turns out that we have 20 natural amino acids that make all the thousands and thousands of proteins that we have in our cells. Very fascinating. And of course, sugars. Sugars, this is like a monomeric sugar. Sugars can make, you know, polymers like cellulose, plasma membrane, right? And so those are the uh, chemistry, uh, the very, very basic unit of the cell. Um, now this slide actually tells you that for the cell survival, for us to function, for our cells to function properly, we also need certain um, elements. And the ones that are shown here in brown are the, what we call bulk elements. Uh, again, I don't want you to memorize this for exams or anything. A lot of things I'm saying here, uh, you know, you need to just know, uh, I'm not gonna ask you to memorize, 
And that's how I will do. I will tell you what not to worry about memorizing for the exam. So that way, it is very important for you to pay attention to the lecture and write it down. He said, he's not going to ask about, because when you ask me that question, I will tell you, remember what I said during the class, go back and look. Um, so, uh, but there are certain elements. Uh, so bulk elements, you know, we typically need uh, in gram quantity in our diet. But then you have, so you, uh, you see here some things in yellow. Uh, they are called trace elements. Trace elements we need in milligram quantities in our diet. Okay. So why do we need these elements? Many of these elements turns out uh, uh, that they are needed for the function of an enzyme. They are cofactor. Okay. So enzymes will not function uh, if you don't have one of these metals like zinc, for example, like manganese or magnesium. So um, again, this is uh, the relative evidence, uh, abundance of important elements. Um, you can see here with respect to carbon here, um, hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. Again, I'm not gonna um, trick you with the questions like you know, what is the most abundant element in the universe, but it's something that I thought you might like to just look at it and feel, have a feel for it. Um, major component of E. coli cells, you will see that 70% of the total weight of E. coli cell is water. Is it surprising to you? Uh, it shouldn't be. Um, we have tons of water actually, and uh, we produce water when actually we are carrying out oxidative metabolism. Um, typically 15% of the weight is proteins and uh, E. coli has about 3000 proteins. So with that, um, I have actually slides that uh, again refreshes you how we can form, um, how bonding happens in chemistry. All of you are aware of this, right? How you form single bond, double bond, things like that. Yes, Professor. Yes, yes. I, wow. I, I'm pretty sure you are very aware, but I, I have kept it so that you can actually look at it and say, yeah, I know all this. I know this is sp2 hybridized carbon this is sp3 hybridized carbon now here you can see sp3 hybridized carbon i have shown you right and uh, this is an sp2 hybridized carbon it's a planar molecule um, these are some of the common functional groups that you will see in bio biochemistry so you you might see a protonated amino group so you can see ns3 plus that's why attached to R group, uh, amido group, you can see uh, amide bond, CUNH2 here, imine, again, these bonds you have to, if you really want to become good at it, you have to write down. Don't, don't just look at it, stare at it like Professor Patak, okay? You need to write this yourself on using pencil and paper, and then you know what is an imine, okay? If you don't do that, I can guarantee you will miss that. Um, and this is uh, N substituted uh, imine, uh, where your hydrogen has been replaced with an alkyl group. Uh, it's called shift base. You will see some shift base chemistry uh, in enzyme class. This is a guanidinium group that you will see in one of your amino acids, arginine. This is another group called imidazole. Uh, you will see uh, this group in your uh, other amino acids, histidine, okay? So these are some common functional groups of biomolecules. You make sure that you know, you draw them. These are sulfhydryl group, just like hydroxyl group, your oxygen is replaced by sulfur. This is disulfide bond. When you take two sulfhydryl group and oxidize them to find form disulfide, that's what the bond looks like. And you have actually various disulfide bonds in many proteins. This is a thioester, not a regular oxygen ester. You can see um, oxygen is replaced by sulfur. So it's a thioester. This is a phosphoryl group. Okay, so you the way it's written, I'm, I want you to understand this very care, carefully. The phosphoryl group as written here is the ones that is shaded in this uh, brown part. So if you want to draw a squiggly line through this bond, that's your phosphoryl group, okay? 
so you can see the phosphoryl group is attached to this alkoxy group. Phospho anhydride. How do you form anhydride? When you two, when you take acids and you dehydrate them, right? So you already know from your organic chemistry knowledge that anhydride bonds are very, very high energy bond and they are very reactive, right? So this is here phosphoanhydride bond right here shown in the brown part. So you can see here two phosphoric acid group, they actually lost water molecule and they form this kind of bond. If a phosphoric acid and a carboxylic acid formed a bond, anhydride bond, you will call them a mixed anhydride bond, okay? And a mixed anhydride bond is also known as acyl phosphate, as shown here. Now, this is a very uh, important molecule called acetyl coenzyme A. Look here, this is three-dimensional structure of the molecule, okay? This is, each of the ball represents the covalent radii of that atom, okay? And if you look at the chemical structure of this molecule, you can here see, right, that um, uh, this, you have an imidazole-like ring, you have amino group. So you can see that there is a nitrogenous base, a sugar moiety, a phosphoryl group. You see phosphoanhydride bond. You also see amido bond here, a hydroxyl group, amido group again, and most importantly, thioester bond right here. Because this whole molecule is called acetyl coenzyme A. This molecule is utilized for the transfer of acetyl group in some enzyme reaction, okay? So all this giant molecule does is that it will take this acetyl group, you can see here thioester, the end molecule right here, and it will transfer to an acceptor molecule whatever that acceptor molecule is. That's all the chemistry it does, okay? So look here, this is very cool. What, if it does such a simple chemistry, all it need to do is that transfer this acetyl group from this giant molecule to another acceptor molecule. Why to have such giant molecule? These groups are not even participating in any of these chemical reactions, right? You, you should certainly ask that question. And the reason is that evolution, the way enzymes evolved, they wanted to ensure that in the enzyme pocket, which will catalyze the transfer of this acetyl group to an acceptor molecule, only acetyl-CoA will bind and only the acceptor molecule will bind so that it transfers the acetyl group only from acetyl-CoA to that substrate molecule. So what are these groups doing there? They're actually providing specificity to the enzyme. They are forming interactions with the enzyme active site. Very, 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 very specific interactions with the residues of the active site groups so that the chemistry that happens by this enzyme is very specific. So that's why sometimes very simple chemistry, but large molecule, right? That's something that you should appreciate. Now, I want to briefly also uh, talk about uh, geometric isomers. Uh, if, when you have a double bond, right? What are geometric isomers? If you recall your ergo one, these are uh, two or more compounds that uh, contain you know, double bonds, for example, uh, but they contain the same number and types of atoms and bonds, okay? Uh, which means the connectivity between the atoms and groups are the same. But what is different is that they have different spatial arrangements of the atoms and groups, okay? So you can see here maleic acid and fumaric acid. This maleic acid is a cis where both carboxylic groups are on the same side and fumaric acid where both carboxylic group are on the opposite side. Okay, so you can take maleic acid and convert it to fumaric acid just by simply heating. It won't happen, why? Because the rotation around the double bond is, is, not, uh, is high energy. You, you cannot provide enough energy to just by heating. 
On the other hand, um, I want to also show you uh, an example of this geometric isomer, uh, isomers, how they are useful in biology or biochemistry. Otherwise, you'll say, why am I even mentioning this? It turns out that every time you see an object, right, you look at an object, the initial event that happens is that your retina will actually detect light uh, from reflected from your object, okay? And it will absorb uh, visible light. That visible light has an, has an energy of about 250 kilojoule per mole, okay? Before the light absorption, the pigment that actually absorbs this light is called 11 cis retinal. You can see it's an aldehyde, but the bond between 11th carbon and 12th carbon is cis. Once the light falls on this pigment molecule in the retina, this cis uh, retinal gets converted to all trans retinal. Okay. And this conversion, cis to trans conversion, actually triggers electrical changes in the retinal cells. And that leads to the nerve impulses. And that's how you actually visualize things. Okay. So this is very important. It happens very rapidly. Uh, millions of times during the day, this chemistry is happening. So um, with that brief introduction, let's talk about chirality, uh, a concept that actually bothers you a lot in your organic chemistry class. But because you have been through your organic chemistry class, I know that you know this concept very well. Um, so when you have a carbon that has four different groups attached to it, right? It's called asymmetric carbon. And when you have such an asymmetric carbon, you will notice that when you make a mirror image of that whole molecule, that mirror image is not superimposable on the original molecule, okay? So chiral molecules are those molecules whose mirror images are not superimposable. Everybody's good with that? Remember all of you? Yeah? Can you repeat yeah. that one more time, Professor? Yes, I will repeat, but that usually will mean that you have to go and put some effort in this uh, concept, okay? There are lots of good videos on YouTube for uh, explaining chirality. So please make sure that you review that. Review that. Chiral molecule as shown here, um, how do you know chiral molecule is chiral? Uh, one way to do is to actually make a mirror image of the molecule. And when you make the mirror image of the molecule, that mirror image of the molecule is not superimposable on the original molecule, okay? So you can see here, if you actually take the mirror image they have shown you here, you too can try to superimpose on this molecule, you will not be able to superimpose. Whatever rotation you can do, but it will not superimpose. And so these are chiral molecules, right? So what is an achiral molecule? They are showing you an example of achiral molecule where you have two groups the same. So when you take a mirror image of those, that achiral molecule, you'll, you'll be able to actually take that, super, uh, that mirror image and literally be able to superimpose that by simply rotation. And that's what they are showing you here, okay? So, do, do molecules, there are many molecules, like for example, proteins, they have more than one chiral centers. Each amino acid, except glycine actually, is a chiral amino acid. And so you have tons of chiral centers in the proteins. And so the proteins that you make are very chiral molecules. And that's why it's very important. Uh, those things are very important for your recognition in biological settings. So what happens when you have two, three di-substituted butanes? Again, just don't look at the slides. I would ask you to draw the slides on a paper and pencil and uh, uh, see for yourself how this is important. Um, I'm just reviewing this for you. So, you know, some of you I know may be a little rusty uh, in this, but when you look, draw the structure, you will, you know, everything should come back to you. So what is this two, three di-substituted butane? You can see it's a four carbon alkane, right? And X and Y. So they have made a, a model of that uh, two, three di-substituted butane. 
they have a they have made a mirror image of this one right here you can see literally you can put a mirror between these two structure and you can see how oh, it looks like a mirror image right you put put a mirror these groups are closer to here these groups are exactly on that side right uh and um same same is true for here but these two are not superimposable there is no way you can take the mirror image right and superimpose on this so these two structures which have two chiral centers two chiral carbons they these mirror images are non superimposable that's why they are enantiomers right so these two are enantiomers these two are enantiomers what are diastereomers diastereomers are stereoisomers that are not mirror images right so if you took this structure right here and this one right here the relationship between this and this is diastereomeric relationship whereas between these two enantiomers between these two enantiomer why because two chiral centers and the mirror images are not superimposable okay so that's a little bit um, revision of your chirality now here is um um tartaric acids right which has also two chiral centers two and three each carbon is connected to four different groups so louis pasteur actually uh, you know uh, who are very early on he realized that the tartaric acids exist in two forms and he was literally able to use the microscope and tweezer to separate these two compounds so um if you took a solution of this right what we call 2r and 3r tartaric acid it will rotate the plane of polarized light in one way okay you took 2s and 3s it will rotate the plane of polarized light in the opposite way but by the same amount so this one let's say was minus 50 this one will be plus 50 degree remember chirality and how you can determine a molecule is chiral you can actually measure optical rotation using polarimeter that's the experiment i'm talking about here so uh, one is dextrorotatory and other one is levo rotatory form okay dextrorotatory will rotate the plane of polarized light towards right levo rotatory will do towards the left so 2r 3r and 2s 3s if you recall the way you define your 2r 3r is you have to invoke kahn in gold prelog system remember you have to assign functional group attached to the asymmetric carbon uh, in terms of uh, priority lowest priority group goes in the back which is four here and then you look at the front uh, in uh, in order of priority 1 2 3 highest priority is 1 highest atomic number molecular uh, atomic number for example 1 2 3 this is going clockwise therefore this is an r in this case 1 2 3 is going anti clockwise therefore it is an s when you are projecting the least priority group in the back that's how you define r and s i don't have to tell you this but i'm just telling you so it all comes back to you um this is conformational of ethane you remember we talked about in your general chemistry class conformational analysis of course uh, many conformation of ethane is possible because of the freedom of rotation around the single bond single cc bond right in this ball and stick model you can see that when the front carbon <laughs> with its three attached hydrogen is ro rotated relative to the back carbon here the potential energy of the molecule actually decreases or increases depending on the position of those functional groups like hydrogens in this case right so highest potential energy most unstable conformation is here because these two hydrogens are in eclipse conformation once you stagger them they become the lowest energy conformation and so on 
Now, I just gave you an example of why, um, why uh, you know, you had to, biology or biochemistry had to have this large structure of acetyl coenzyme A just to do a very simple chemistry, transferring acetyl group to an acceptor molecule. That was because so that you actually only, uh, so that acetyl coenzyme A only binds to the enzyme it's supposed to go and bind. There is, you know, structural complementarity uh, um, so that it is more specific. And same thing is shown here. This is actually just to show you, uh, this is uh, actual uh, RNA of uh, a portion of HIV virus that actually is binding to a drug called arginamide. Okay, so uh, don't worry about this. All I'm trying to show you here is that this is a drug molecule that goes and binds to the RNA portion of the HIV virus. And that's how actually uh, it inhibits the uh, viral replication. And you can see that there is literally a groove where this molecule can go and insert itself and bind by utilizing non-covalent forces that we'll talk about in, in the coming slides. Um, can I give you some more example, fun example um, about um, uh, importance of stereochemistry, chirality. Okay, so here is uh, aspartame, okay? Aspartame is this artificial sweetener that is actually uh, uh, sold under the trade name NutraSweet. And it's basically, it's a dipeptide. Dipeptide means it's, it's a peptide bond formed between two amino acids. So one is here and the other one is here, okay? And you can see peptide bond here. It's an L-aspartyl, L-phenylalanine, methyl ester. Okay, so the carboxyl end is methyl ester. But don't worry, just focus your attention on this, chirality of this carbon, okay? This is the one that actually um, is the structure for aspartame. That is the one, if you actually put it on your tongue, will taste sweet, okay? So you have two chiral centers you can see here, both L and L. If you just invert one chiral center here in phenyl phenylalanine, okay? which is what they have done here. The same molecule with exactly same kind of functional group, just difference in chirality at one carbon. If you put this molecule on your tongue, it will taste you bitter. Think about the specificity of interactions. Why, how do you get that sense of sweetness and bitterness? Because on your tongue, you have certain proteins, certain receptor molecules that when they will bind to these molecules, will elicit response in such a manner that your brain will say this is sweet and this is bitter. It's fascinating. This is how biochemistry is cool. Specificity of interactions. Okay, so in the last uh, few minutes, I think we have about eight minutes left. I want to quickly talk about a very important processes that happens in biochemistry, which is what we call energy coupling, okay? So energy coupling is nothing but you can drive a chemical reaction that is endorganic, free energy wise, by coupling it to a reaction that is exorganic. That's what coupling is. And that is what is shown here, you know, very simple. You know, you have a block that you have to actually you are you, you doing work to raise this object on a slope like this. So you are actually, this is a kind of example of, a, an, of an endorganic reaction. Delta G is positive, more than zero. But once you are here, you can actually use that potential energy to do a reaction because this is an exorganic reaction. Delta G is negative because this block and slide on its own just because of the potential energy and actually can you know that potential energy can be converted to kinetic energy and that kinetic energy will convert it to do whatever work you want to do okay so that's the idea of uh, energy coupling and i will talk about this many times i think at least two three times in uh, going forward but i want to give you a little bit uh, you know uh, idea about that now 
It turns out that first thing when you take sugar molecule, first reaction that happens is that your glucose molecule gets converted to glucose 6-phosphate. That's what your cells do, okay, in the metabolism. So technically speaking, you can just take glucose molecule and phosphate. PI is inorganic phosphate called phosphate molecule, okay? You can, the reaction is take glucose plus inorganic phosphate and you make glucose 6-phosphate. You should be able to do, but it turns out there is no enzyme that does that. There is no enzyme. And this reaction is highly endorganic in reaction. You can see free energy on the y-axis and reaction coordinate on the x-axis. You can see that delta G is positive. Product minus reactant will be a positive number. So this is an, ex an, ex an endorganic reaction. But if you really have to do, you, if you really have to do convert glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, you can still do it by coupling it, coupling it, coupling this reaction to an highly exorganic reaction. What is an example of high, a highly exorganic reaction? Hydrolysis of ATP to ADP and inorganic phosphate. You can see that this is a really downhill, highly exorganic reaction. Delta G is negative. So if you couple reaction one and two, you will eventually get reaction three. But in this case, your reactant will become glucose plus ATP, getting glucose 6-phosphate plus ADP. And overall reaction of this reaction 3 is now overall negative. So you couple the energy, exergonic energy of reaction 2 with the endergonic reaction of 1, and you were able to convert glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. That's what energy coupling is. Now we'll talk about this more a little bit later, but just so, know, just so you know, free energy is on the y-axis. Free energy, thermodynamics is the difference between the product free energy and reactant free energy. But kinetics is the activation energy barrier here, right? So if you don't have a catalyst, this is the activation energy barrier shown here in the blue, delta G uncatalyzed. But if you have a catalyst, you can rapidly do the reaction because the activation energy barrier is lowered for the, with the help of the catalysis. That's how you speed up the reaction uh, of um, uh, using catalyst. You know that free energy is comprised of enthalpy and a component of entropy. And I'm just revising you, so make sure you go over that and you know. I want to show you some energy rich molecule and this is the ATP molecule shown here, okay? So these bonds have very high energy in them. And that's why they are utilized to, uh, in many metabolic reaction. So ATP is this structure. You should know the structure of ATP. The second very high energy molecule is NADPH that is utilized in reductive biosynthesis. And you can see here that it's nicotinamide diphosphate. Okay, and you will see this molecule again and again. And so when you are actually doing metabolism, you take fuel and then you metabolize it using catabolic reaction. And that is usually an exergonic process because you produce ATP and NADPH. Okay, so that's metabolism. What we call it in strictly speaking sense, it's a catabolic reaction, okay? Sometimes you need to make new proteins, new carbohydrates, new fatty acids. And if you have to do those reactions and your cells are constantly doing those reactions, those reactions are called anabolic reactions. And they are usually endorganic in reaction in nature. And therefore they utilize molecules like ATP and NADPH to carry out those um, anabolic reactions. Typically anabolic reactions will be like, for example, taking amino acids and making a larger biomolecule like proteins. Okay. DNA itself uh, is a very stable molecule. You know that very well, right? Um, you uh, know that because you have this very strong hydrogen bonding interactions between the sugar bases. Literally, you can leave a DNA at room temperature and uh, you know, DNA will remain there for months without any issues unless you have contamination of enzymes. And that's because it's a very, very rock solid material. No, no surprising that that DNA is utilized as the genetic code because it's very, it's not too unstable. One thing I want to quickly uh, show uh, you is that 
you know how DNA gets converted to protein, right? DNA is the gene. So here you are seeing the hexokinase genes flanked by introns, uh, junk DNA, if you want to call it. So when the hexokinase gene is transcribed, you basically are producing messenger RNA, right? And then messenger RNA is, will be translated using ribosome to create this polypeptide chain, which is the uh, unfolded chain of hexokinase. And sometimes you may need certain proteins uh, to fold this uh, unfolded hexokinase into a nice globular structure that is catalytically competent, that is catalytically active. And when that happens, what will happen is this hexokinase, you know what reaction it does? It's a very important reaction. It will take glucose and it will take ATP and make glucose 6-phosphate, the reaction I just talked to you about. Okay, so that's what it does. So it's great, but it turns out that sometimes mistake happens, okay, in during evolution. And it is possible sometimes that genes can get duplicated in your genome. So a rare mistake can happen that you have the original gene, but you also duplicated that gene into your genome. Fine, that happened, all right. It can also happen in subsequent evolution process that you can create a mutation in your duplicated gene. And so if that happened, it turns out that you may have produced a species with, which might be able to survive in a very unique niche environment, new environment. What, is, what do I mean by that? Well, it turns out that you know, your original gene will take ATP and make ADP and glucose 6-phosphate and will go on eventually to make ATP, right? It cannot use any other sugar as a substrate. It will only like glucose because that's how the active site has evolved. But because the second copy of the gene had a mutation, now it turns out that active site can bind another type of sugar called galactose. It might be able to take galactose and ATP and may be able to make galactose 6-phosphate. Now you have a species that you, when if you try to starve out of glucose, it can utilize galactose as the fuel source and continue to evolve, procreate, divide, and function. So you have, you have basically created a new function of this hexokinase, which has a new substrate specificity. Okay, so that's what uh, you know. I wanted to talk to you about in this class, a lot of basics and uh, to get you up and started. I will stop here, uh, the recording, and uh, I will ask if any other questions. Okay, thank you.